know, we just yeah. thank and praise God, and we're going to just sing with Hallelujah. excitement yeah. that we are friends with the King of Kings. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. 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 God, we yeah. bless you. We magnify you, God. Yeah. Hallelujah. Thank you, God. Hallelujah. Yes, Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you, God. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Listen. Who am I that you are mindful of me? amazing. Come on, who am I? Who am I that you are mindful of me? That you hear me when I call. When I call. Yeah. Is it true? Is it true that you are thinking of me? How you love, How me. You love me? It's amazing.
for being my friend, God. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Yes. It's amazing. It's amazing. As the song said, it is amazing that Christ died for me while I was yet a sinner. And even now, going through and still sinning sometimes, he still says, you are my friend. Yes. Hallelujah. Yeah. That motivates yeah. you to get it right. That motivates you to lay on the altar until it's right. That motivates you to set boundaries when boundaries are needed. Hallelujah. 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 Because, see, you can't sing with that or, or as Brother Earl and Sister Ambrosia, dance with that freedom. Amen. With that freedom. Hallelujah. Yes. See, he don't need a partner. He already got a heavenly partner. Don't you see him dancing with the Lord? I, I can just see that. I, I hear that song. I can only imagine. Lord, what would I do when I get before you? And I can see Brother Earl just doing a two-step with Lord. thank you. We thank you, God. We thank you for loving us. We thank you for loving us, not just with love, but God, your word says unconditional. He's not like another man or woman that's remembering what you did yesterday or what you just did, but he loves us unconditionally, which motivate us to come back and say, God, forgive us of all our sins. Cleanse us, God, from all our unrighteousness. God, that our worship would be for real. That our worship would be as John 4 says, God, in spirit and in truth. For your word says that you seek after those who would worship you in spirit and in truth, God. So, God, help us, God, to, to lay everything, God, before you, to lay aside every weight, God, that so easily beset us, Lord Jesus. God, that we might worship you in spirit and in truth, God, that our worship would be for real, God. So we thank you, God, this day. We call upon you, God, to fill us up, Lord Jesus, God, from the inside out, Lord, that we might be a light that would shine in darkness, God, and that you would be glorified. Because, God, you are great. Your name is great. Hallelujah. God, we bless you. We thank you, God. Hallelujah, Lord. Yeah. Thank you, God. Hallelujah. Yeah. Hallelujah. Yeah. Hallelujah. Listen. The splendor of a king, oh, clothed in majesty, let all the earth rejoice, hey, let all the earth rejoice, he wraps himself in light, and darkness tries to hide, and trembles at his voice, trembles at his voice. How great is our God. Come on. Sing with me. How great is our God. And all will see how great, how great yeah. is our God. Oh, 
it's okay. We'll get to it. Hallelujah. We're going to come back to the Godhead. Thank you, Lord. Go back to the Godhead. The Godhead three in one. Father, Spirit, Father, Spirit, and Son. The Lion and the Lamb. The Lion and the Lamb. Yeah. How great is our God. Say with me, how great is our God. And all will see how great, how great is our God. Oh, see how great, how great is our God. Sing with me, Sing with me. how great is our God. And all will see how great, how great, how great is our God. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Listen, you're the name. Sing with me 
Just worship him, worship him. He is a great and an awesome. He is a great and Amen. Amen. Oh, we bless your mighty name, Jesus. How great. How great. Hallelujah. When we say that our God is a great God, we're not just saying that he is a cut above everyone else. Oh no, it's much more than that. Come on, we're, we're, not even, we're not even saying that he's in a class all by himself. Hallelujah. He created the class. Amen. He created the class. And I just want us to know that whatever the need is in your life today, he is great enough to meet that need. Come on, he is great. Yes, God. How many of you have a great need in your life? Amen. Where you need God to be great. Anybody? Hallelujah. I know there are some of us this morning. They've been fighting with illness and sickness. We want to believe that our great God is a great healer. Some of us have been fighting with sorrow and, and discouragement. Hallelujah. But our God is a great joy giver. Amen. I'm going to ask Sister Tyra and the worship team to lead us in that song. And I want to challenge you to make a step of faith this morning. Don't stay there at your seat. Come on, if he's a great God and you're going through something where you need God to be great, come on. Brother Sam, where are you at, Brother Sam? I'm going to ask Brother Sam. The Bible says, if any among you is sick, let him call for the elders and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the Bible says, he will be healed. Amen. The Lord will raise him up. Sometimes our sickness is physical. Sometimes it's emotional. But whatever the need is, we know a great God who's the answer. Isn't that right? I wish I knew heard somebody here that believed that. We have a great God, and we know he's the answer. Amen? Amen. And so as the worship team sings, I want to challenge you. Come on, just take a step of faith. Me, Brother Sam, myself, and we just want to anoint you with oil and pray that that great God will meet the need in your life. Amen? Come on, let's sing it. Is our God. Sing with me how great is our God. And all sing how great. Yes, God. How great is our God.
Let's just worship the Lord. Come on, in his presence. How great. How great. Come on, turn your eyes to him. Lord, we thank you for this. Thank you for your presence this morning. Hallelujah for the life that you have to give. Lord, I want you to be great in my life. I don't want to just be ordinary. I don't just want to go through the motions of church. I want you to be great in my life. I want the power of your spirit to overwhelm and saturate my life. Lord, be great in my life. Be great, Lord God, as, as a representative to you, Lord God, and my family. Be great for you, God. 
Lord, on my job. Be great for you, Lord God, when I'm just going through my daily activities. Be great in my life. Show up in my life, God. Show up in a powerful way. Make yourself known in my life and through my life. In Jesus' name, we just bring before you this morning all of those things in our lives, God, that have seemed to be impossible. Those impossible barriers, those impossible dreams that you put in our heart, God. Those impossibilities that the enemy has tried to intimidate us with, we put them before you right now. God, and we believe you to be great. Be a great savior for that one that we have been praying for, for their salvation. God, be a great provider for those needs, God, that have been long unmet. God, show yourself to be a great provider. Jehovah Jireh, our provider. Show yourself to be a great healer for those that have been sick. Jehovah Rapha, the Lord, our healer. God, be Jehovah Mekedesh, God, the one that sanctifies us and purifies us. That no hold of the enemy, no work of the flesh will lay hold upon my life but it has to let loose in Jesus' name. Sanctify us, perfect us, purify us. Holy vessels before you we pray in Jesus' name. Be all that your name says that you are. Be our healer, be our provider, be our sanctifier, hallelujah. Be our guide and our shepherd, hallelujah. Be all that we need you to be in Jesus' name. Thank God, thank God. Come on, give the Lord a hand, a hand of praise to the Lord, amen. Hallelujah. be great in your life. Amen. Hallelujah. Come on, before you're seated, turn to somebody and say, God is great. Amen. God is great. Amen. God is great. Yes, he is. God is great. Hallelujah. Thank God. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. Amen. Praise the Lord. Good morning, Grace family. Oh, come on. Good morning, Grace family. Amen. It's good to see you in the house of the Lord this morning. We want to welcome you. It's good to see everybody. And we also just want to welcome all of the Grace family that's watching online. Amen. Hallelujah. We wish you could be here and feel what we're feeling. Amen. But we know that God is there where you are as well. Praise the Lord. Because we serve a God that is great enough that he's not limited to any physical location. Amen. He's not even limited to a certain time in the week. Amen. That anybody, anywhere, where they call upon his name can find out that he's a great God. He shows up. Amen. And he does great things. Isn't that right? Hallelujah. How many know the Lord has done some great things on your life? And it wasn't even in church. Amen. Hallelujah. Nobody even had to lay hands on you. God just did something great in your life. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise God. We thank God for his goodness. Amen. Amen. We are so grateful for his presence. Amen. Grateful for all the Grace family. We're thankful for you. Praise the Lord. Amen. A lot of times we just want to welcome also all the new friends of Grace. We always say at Grace that um, we don't have any strangers. We only have friends. We only have friends, some of whom we're meeting for the first time. And so we just want to say God bless you to uh, any of the new friends to here this morning. Amen. Would you just give us an opportunity just to welcome you? Just whip up your hands and say, hey, that's me. I'm a new friend. Are you here? Amen. God bless you. God bless you. Amen. Amen, Brother Sam. Amen. Hallelujah. Get that. Go ahead and welcome our, our new friend this morning. We just have a little gift that we would like to share with you to let you know that we are so glad that you're here with us this morning. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Well, it is, it is Missions Sunday, as is our custom. Uh, and it's the last Missions Sunday of 2023. Can you believe that? Wow. The year has moved quickly. Uh, but we are here in December, our Mission Sunday. And I did want to give you a brief report back. Uh, we had a wonderful Missions Banquet uh, just last month. Had a great time. Amen. Uh, missions Committee team, they set the bar high here. So I don't know what's going to happen next year. Amen. But, but we had a great missions banquet and uh, we took our missions pledges. And I just want to give a, a brief report back to let you know that we took up pledges uh, enough to cover 
our, our, all of our missions giving to all of our missionaries. Amen. So all of our missionary budget, the, the current missionaries is covered. Amen. Somebody say praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Amen. And so just as God's people uh, continue to give, as God provides the need, we know we're going to continue not only to give at the level that we've been giving, but we want to add missionaries. Amen. We want to increase what we're giving to missions. Isn't that right? Amen. Come on. How many of you like a raise on your job? Amen. Oh, 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 oh yeah. We, we can relate to that. Amen. Come on. We can't just give our missionaries what we gave them three years ago and four years ago and five years ago and expect that they're going to keep on doing the same work. Come on, somebody. But we need to increase our giving. Amen. Just to break even. But I do just want to say I'm so appreciative and so grateful to all our family for your giving um, and your pledges for the upcoming year. We are looking forward to moving uh, to doing greater in our giving uh, for 2024. Uh, for those of you that were not here at the missions banquet and were not able to make your pledge, uh, we didn't forget about you. <laughs> we didn't forget about you. If you look at to this morning, we have a little card in there. It's called a faith promise card. It looks like this. If you look in your bulletin, oh, come on, you're not looking in your bulletin. I don't see you looking in your bulletin. Come on. There's a little faith card that looks like this. And what that is, it is just a promise between you and God. It's not with me. It's not with this church. But it's just saying, God, as you provide the resources in my hands, I'm going to take some of that, which already belongs to you anyway, and I'm going to give that to missions so that somebody can find Jesus. Amen. Thank you. Somebody can find Jesus. Did you know there may be somebody in heaven because you gave? Somebody that you never met, you never witnessed to them, but they find their way into heaven and it will be because of your giving and somebody that share the gospel with them somewhere, maybe on the other part of the world that we as a church family help support. So I just want to encourage you uh, to, to ask the Lord what he would have you to do as a weekly or a monthly faith promise that says, Lord, as you put this in my hands, I'm going to give it to missions to see that the mission of the church moves forward. Um, and when we take up the offering at the end of service, you can just drop that faith promise in the offering envelope and, or I mean, in the offering plate and uh, we'll tally that up and we'll include that with the giving that we give uh, to our missionaries. Isn't that exciting that you can have an impact on something that's going on around the world? Amen. Amen. And if you, and you, if you want to know what that is, I'll just give you one example. Uh, also, this has been provided for you guys, a little book we call The Gateway Project. The Gateway Project, this has been uh, one of the missions uh, projects for our district of the Assemblies of God, SoCal Network of the Assemblies of God, that provides water uh, for places that don't have the luxury of having clean water like we have. Uh, and you think, well, what's the big deal about that? Well, when you provide clean water, then you cut down on waterborne diseases. Come on, and people's lives improve. Their lives get better. Amen? And so we just want to be a part of seeing people's lives improve and lifted, uh, not only spiritually in their relationship with the Lord, but also physically. And so um, that's just something for you to, to be able to peruse and see a part of what our missions giving goes towards. Amen? Amen. Well, missions is not only what happens around the world. You might need to turn that up. But they're not hearing me back, brother. You might even turn that up. Missions isn't only what happens around the world. Missions is what happens outside these doors. Everything outside the doors of this church is missions, Brother Earl. Because there are a lot of needs and there are a lot of uh, bondages that exist right here in our nation. And I don't even have to tell you all of those. Um, but this morning we have uh, an esteemed uh, warrior, a fighter uh, in, in missions here domestically. Amen. Uh, it reaches around the world. Uh, but um, I'm not going to be the one to, uh, to introduce our esteemed uh, colleague and, and soldier for the Lord this morning. I'm going to ask Pastor Melissa if she would come this morning. Give her a hand as she comes. Amen. Amen. And she's going to give our guests a proper greeting. Amen. Yes. I have had the opportunity to be able to serve with Dr. Sandra Morgan on the um, advisory board at Vanguard University for sex and human trafficking. I've, I've served there for a couple years now. And so I'm very grateful to come across her path and meet her, and um, she's become a friend of mine and a great guide and teacher in some things that I'm learning from her life. 
um, Dr. Sandra Mo Morgan, an educator and nurse, is recognized globally for her expertise in combating human trafficking and working to end violence against women and children. Dr. Sandra Morgan's experience has been serving exploited women, men, and children includes direct care as a pediatric nurse, a volunteer with doctors, of the world, Athens and Greece. And as a past administrator of the Orange County Human Trafficking Task Force, she has been a tireless advocate for victims of exploitation, slavery, and trafficking across the world, including South America, Russia, Europe, Africa, and the Middle East. She serves on the Orange County Commercial Sexual Exploitation of Children Steering Committee, partnering with Children, Child Welfare, and Juvenile Justice. In her roles as a faculty um, and director of Vanguard University, where I graduated from, for Global Center for Women and Justice, she builds capacity for research, education, and advocacy directly related to the exploitation of women and children, consistently bringing together diverse groups to collaborate during their annual Ensure Justice Conference as well as special focus summits. Her desire is to see human trafficking in. She is a co-author of a book called Ending Human Trafficking, which I'm currently reading and I'm learning a, a lot of good things. Her End Human Trafficking podcast has listeners in 148 countries. Let us welcome Dr. Sandra Morgan. Oh, thank you, Pastor Melissa, Pastor Earl, for this invitation. And we actually, my husband and I, were full-time Assemblies of God world missionaries for over 20 years before coming back to serve at Vanguard. And you were one of our regular supporters. So I'd love to have my husband come and just give a greeting and a thank you. It truly is a blessing to be able to be with you and to remind us what uh, Peter said. He says, praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In him, God the Father, mercy, great mercy, he has given his new birth into a living hope and into an inheritance that will neither spoil, perish, spoil, nor fade, kept in heaven for you. We are here to continue that message to give to those outside these walls that they can have the same kind of hope that you and I have. Thank you for inviting us back. It's great to be here again. It has been a refreshing morning already. And I, uh, Pastor Tara, where is she? So, uh, the worship time was just such a precious moment. I remember years ago hearing that when you lift your hands like this, uh, say, God just pushed all that flow right through me, right direct. It's like a funnel. And as, as she turned up the um, volume and the force, it was like a refreshing spring just washing through. And the whole week, um, you get stuck, stuck, and you need a chance to clean it all out, right? So you run the faucet. Full, um, fully open. 
So I'm grateful because that means you're all ready to hear the word that I feel God wants to share with you. I am so grateful to Pastor Earl's invitation for me to be here on Mission Sunday. You heard Pastor Melissa. We have listeners to our Ending Human Trafficking podcast in 148 countries. Sometimes those are places where we can't even send a missionary. And yet we have that reach right here in Southern California. I want to, I think I have a PowerPoint, and um, I'll pull that up. This is a picture. Gene and I were in Greece for 10 years, and this picture is called a pithari. Pithari is the Greek word for a vessel, a large vessel. Everybody say pithari. That was to check if you're awake, and you get to go home and say, I learned a word in Greek. Um, this is from the palace of Nosos on the island of Crete, and we were touring there. We were teaching in the church, and we went into the kitchen of this palace, and it was down steep stairs. And in the pantry, they had these jars. And I was astounded because when I stood next to one, it was, I could have stu stood up inside of it. And you'd just barely be able to see my head. Now, that wouldn't work for Jean, but it would work for me. And they said they filled these with olive oil and with grain and with olives but the stairs were narrow. This is 3,000 years ago. Um, how did they get them into the pantry? Because the people of that time were about my size. So you'd have to have a lot of people to get it down there. And they didn't have an elevator or a crane. So they were brilliant. They baked Candles when they made the jar from the top to the bottom. Look at that. From the top to the bottom. And you know, when you're moving something downstairs, you can't just have two guys hanging on to it. You've got to have a way to hang on. And this pithari is the image I have in my mind when I think about the work of the Global Center for Women and Justice. It is heavy. It deals with violence against children, against families, against men, against women. It deals with people selling other people. It deals with patriarchal systems that don't allow little girls to get an education or patriarchal systems that marry little girls to older men. That's still happening. These are heavy issues. And there isn't a single way to address all of them. So these baked on handles, I want you to think about what is your handle in moving this forward as part of the body, the community, the culture of Christ. What is your role? And at the Global Center for Women and Justice, we have research, education, advocacy, collaboration to build hope. It spells the word reach. And at heart, for me, no matter what I'm doing, I am a missionary. I'm ordained with the Assemblies of God. My husband and I are still under the Assemblies of God World Missions as short-term missionaries. And I am constantly trying to figure out how do we be salt and light 
in our world. And I want to take all of you with me. I want you to be salt and light. That's why I serve on things like the Commercially Sexually Exploited Children Steering Committee in Orange County or the Public-Private Partnership Advisory Council under the President's Interagency Human Trafficking Task Force. I want to be salt and light. Everybody say, salt and light. Salt and light. So I want everyone to think about your handle as we walk through some of the areas where you can make a difference. We have a, a quick way to address our mission statement. Study the issues, be a voice, make a difference. So we're going to study a little bit. When we were in Greece and I volunteered at the Doctors of the World Shelter, I met a young woman. Her name was um, not Maria, but I'm going to tell this story because I don't want to use her real name. She was victimized as uh, under human trafficking law descriptions as a young woman who had just graduated from high school in the Ukraine. Her father had died in a Chechnyan conflict, and this is way before the current war in Ukraine. And her mother and eight-year-old brother were counting on Maria to become the breadwinner. And she did well in high school. But the Soviet Union had collapsed. There were no jobs. And so when she saw an ad that they were hiring in Athens, Greece, in the tourist industry, at a hotel, she and her best friend took the bus to the big city for the day when they would be interviewing candidates for those jobs. She stood in line. She filled out a job application, and it wasn't printed on an inkjet printer. It was a real job application. I would have filled out everything if I was desperate to get a job, and that's what she did. At the end of the day, she came home. She told her mother, I got the job, and we leave in two weeks. And on the appointed day, she showed up at the train station with her passport, all of her legal documents. She got on that train that went from um, Kiev down to the Black Sea, where then they took a ferry across into Turkey. She was full of dreams. She told her mother, I'm going to send half of the money to you and half I'm saving to go to nursing school. She had dreams. But that night, when they put each of the girls in a separate hotel room in a very dumpy little hotel on the border of Turkey and Greece, she had no sooner laid her head on the pillow when four men dressed in police uniforms barged in and brutalized her. Before dawn, the madame came, took her downstairs, exchanged an envelope with money with the driver of a car, and they hid her in the false bottom of the trunk. They duct taped her hands, her wrists, and her mouth, and she was driven across the border where she was sold to the highest bidder of brothel owners. Prostitution is legal in Greece. For the next 19 to 20 months, they moved her every two or three weeks. And when she was, I hate to use the word, rescued, she was actually part of a group of 11 girls that the brothel owners called the police tip line. And they all placed them in one location because they were too sick to work anymore. They couldn't make money. Human trafficking is about greed. It's about people wanting more money. And the Bible says 
that the root of all evil is the love of money. That's what greed is. Now, Maria's story tells the elements of human trafficking. When someone is recruited and obtained and then provided for someone else to, through the use of force, fraud, or coercion. And in Maria's story, it started out with fraud. What did they offer her? A job. And then it moved to force, and they brutalized her. And then the last element, coercion. Now, remember she filled out that job application for an overseas job. She had to give all of her family contact information. So when she realized that she had been tricked, they said, you can't leave. Oh, but if you run away, we have your family's address, and we will get your eight-year-old brother to take your place. Maria was trapped. Her story has been used over and over again to teach, to do prevention. I taught it to um, all the leaders in a group in Zambia. And they made me tell the story over and over again. And I hope when you leave here today, you remember all the elements of the story. And if you don't, go back and listen to episode number 85 of the Ending Human Trafficking podcast because it teaches about force, fraud, and coercion. So a few years later, when I was at the United Nations, the leader of that training I did in Zambia was there, and she saw me, and she came, and she said, did you hear the news? I said, I think I know. Somebody had called me. That story was used to train leaders in all six Zambian states, in the churches, in the communities, in the schools. So when six young people between 14 and 16 accepted a job traveling to the capital of Zambia, which is Lusaka, there will be a test later. No? Okay. Um, one of the boys said, when they put each of the kids in a separate hotel room, he said the hair on the back of his neck stood up and he remembered the story of Maria. He was skinny little 14-year-old, so he climbed out the bathroom window, found the police station, they came back, they arrested four traffickers, rescued those boys. Those church leaders found their handle by learning, getting educated, what it looks like. And then they advocated, and they told that over and over and over again. The scripture that I want to look at with you today actually calls us to have more than just compassion, distant compassion. And so my sermon title is Love That Abounds. And I'm in Philippians chapter 1. And if you've got your Bible, do you mark in your Bible? Yes? Okay, get your pen out. And I love this, Pastor. You've already given them homework after I preach. I love it. I, I'm going to give you guys some hints if you've got your notes here. Um, I looked at this during the prayer time. I was praying and reading. Um, and number four, I think one thing you could do is subscribe and follow Global Center for Women and Justice. There's stuff of our table. That's a really good way to answer number four. But right now, we can click the slide. Um, this is what it says in Philippians 1, 9 through 11. 
Now, the people that talk to me about ending human trafficking have one thing they almost always say. I just want to love the victims. And mostly that means they want to do something directly with a victim. I'm all about prevention. Those six young people in Zambia never became victims. Never. Isn't that great? So Paul answered my question. I kept asking God, how do I tell people thank you but no thank you? Um, your idea of loving people is not trauma-informed. It isn't um, educational. It's not doing prevention. So I found this scripture. It's been there forever. I grew up memorizing. And then suddenly it made sense. And this is my prayer, that your love may abound more and more, not through feelings, through knowledge and depth of insight knowledge and depth of insight so that you may be able to discern what is best and may be pure and blameless until the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. Now, let's Go to the next slide. I just want to talk about knowledge and insight. Knowledge and insight. Where are you going to get knowledge and insight so that your love may be abounding? If you want to fight human trafficking with me, you can listen to the podcast. You can take classes like Pastor Melissa. You can read the book. We brought extra copies to sell today. You can come to our Insured Justice Conference. And I have to tell you, this congregation is really high on my priority list for engaging in community outreach. The demographic of our own youth that become victims of human trafficking, whether they are labor trafficking or sex trafficking victims, are overrepresented by youth who are um, people of color. And, you know, can I just be really, really direct? Is that okay? I want young African-American boys and girls to understand, just like those kids in Zambia, how much higher their risk is. But I have to tell you, take a look at me. I am like white sliced bread. I wear sunscreen and a hat. I have blue eyes. I, I, I was invited to go and speak at a school assembly where I think it was in L.A. somewhere about 15 years ago, and they were wonderful to me. But I'm also a grandma, and so they treated me really sweet. But when I told them about the risk, they kind of like rolled their eyes and was like, you don't know what you're talking about, lady. So I started looking around and I did some research. Remember my mission, reach research education. I found out peer to peer is better. So I got the knowledge and then I got the insight. And so then, and my next slide makes the word discern. Then I had the wisdom to make choices and say, no, I'm not coming to your school, but I'm going to send some Vanguard students. I'm going to send students 
who look like you, who are closer to the same age, and you are not going to roll your eyes at them. We have to have that kind of discernment, that wisdom. We need discernment in how we use our limited resources. We need discernment in who we let come through those doors. If you've got a website that is fabulous, that's wonderful. But I've seen websites that are like a mile wide and a half an inch deep. And then I've seen other websites that are like less than 12 inches wide, but really deep. If you pick up the, the little, I thought I had a card here. If you pick up this, this little card, because I know you don't want to carry a bunch of that big stuff. If you pick up this GCWJ card, it has everybody. I have a friend, 84 years old. We got to a restaurant. She goes, oh, get your phone out, Dr. Morgan. This is where the menu is. I'm like, my 84-year-old friend is teaching me this. This QR code goes to our website, and I honestly, um, you could spend 10 minutes getting down to the bottom of it because there are so many opportunities that it leads to to learn more about human trafficking so that you will have knowledge and insight to discern don't trust everybody talking about human trafficking. And I think I have about 15 minutes left. I'm good? Okay. So one of the biggest things that I have learned in combating human trafficking and being a leader, working with a lot of nonprofit organizations, those organizations are not all created equal. Some of them use 85% of what you give them to pay the people who are coming to raise money. So not, so 15%, this is based on research, 15% went to victims. Now, is that a good investment strategy? I don't think so. That's why I love being part of the Assemblies of God World Missions, where I know that people have to report, they have to be accountable for what we give them. That's good discernment. We also have to be careful about what people say. There are a lot of myths out there about human trafficking. There are a lot of, of people promoting strategies, I wouldn't call them strategies. They're kind of misrepresenting the whole process and um, I don't publicly talk about this. My husband's nodding his head, go ahead. So this discernment thing, people are using the issue of human trafficking to build their own social media brand, to raise money that doesn't go to victims that promotes strategies and plans that look great on paper, but they are not best practice. We're going to talk more about that. And I'm going to come back to discernment. Let me get on. Let's talk about what is best. Because this says that that discernment is so that you can understand what is best, pure, and blameless. So what is best? Best is the next slide. Just thinking. Best is when you go to the grocery store and you get the extra large grade A flat of eggs. Best is when you go to the bakery and you get today's fresh baked bread. When my husband was a home missions pastor, we went to the day old bakery. Um, I Best, best is evidence-based. You can taste it. You can see it. You can research it. You know that it is top of the line. Research has figured out how to test 
a lot of the things, and we can check and see if our gas is pure, if our olive oil is pure. I lived in Greece for 10 years. Olive oil is really important to me. It may not be to you. That wasn't a culturally relevant illustration. Best. So we need to know what is best so that we have better discernment. And I'm pretty good in a lot of areas to tell you what is best. Victim services, prevention, education, um, collaboration with law enforcement. I'm really good at that. But there are lots of things I am not good at. So I need to collaborate with the rest of my community so that I have people who have a handle on that jug that are best at the places that we need to carry. That's why I need you. Now, for that discernment, besides knowing what is best and understanding it, having insight, we also, for discernment, for wisdom, we need to find what is pure. So pure is different than best. It's based on motives. Why are we doing what we're doing? Are we doing this to promote our own brand? Are we doing this to get to 10,000 followers so we can be an influencer? Are we doing this so that we can monetize our YouTube? Are we keeping our motives pure. And this is not a new thing that is because of social media. We saw it in the New Testament. Paul talked about Apollo. And what was his motive? He wanted people to follow him. See that whole like and followers thing? It is ages and ages old. And we have to check our hearts we sing that song, cleanse my heart, oh God. We have to keep our motives pure. So for discernment, we got to check out what is their motive. Now we keep our motives pure. But if you're letting somebody through the door or you're writing a check, you have to check and have discernment for what is best and what is pure. And the third element of this rubric, I'm a teacher, I create rubrics for my students and they get graded. And if I give them three things and they only turn in two, they do not get an A. They might get a B minus. I don't wanna go to heaven with a B minus. Anybody here? I want an A. You want an A? Okay, so say best, pure, and blameless. So what's the blameless thing? What's the blameless? Why is it? If it's best and pure, don't you think that's going to be blameless? I've, I've, I've spent a lot of time thinking about this blameless piece. And I was, uh, when we started writing this book, during COVID, my friends said, um, let's turn your podcast into a book. And that's how that happened, because we couldn't go anywhere. What'd you do during COVID? Jean? No. Um, and I remembered, as I answered the question, the publisher, InterVarsity Press, said, write your why. And I remember the day I was sitting in Washington, D.C. I was the administrator of the Orange County Human Trafficking Task Force. And they had a thousand of us from across the U.S. at Department of Justice for training. And during one lunch, they split our task force groups into table talk lunch sessions. And the question to answer was what is one of your challenges for community engagement? So the task force, um, half of our group joined Texas and half of Texas joined ours. 
and the sergeant, it was like watching a movie. He got to this question and he kicked his chair back. I always wonder how all those, those police officers can balance on two legs. It looked just like in the movies, but he was doing it. And he just said, oh, that's easy. It's the wacko church people. Oh, I was silent. I was like, okay, God, give me some wisdom here. And my um, law enforcement co-chair of the task force filled the gap. He looked at this sergeant and he said, <clears throat> she's one of them. And I just quipped very quickly, I can marry you and I can bury you. And everybody laughed. But then I said, you know, I have the same problem. We just had a church that decided they were going to go undercover at a hotel in Santa Ana. And they wired up. They called the news media. They had a team of prayer warriors outside. Doesn't that sound awesome? Is it best, pure, or blameless? Oh, my goodness. They, they, they talked a girl into leaving with them. Um, now, the media were waiting. They put her face on the news, so now she's not safe. They weren't law enforcement, so the traffickers got away. Nobody was prosecuted. We had to fly her out of California for her own safety. It was not best, it was not pure, and it was not blameless. And when I was in D.C., that kind of thing is why he said that. And it meant that God's people were called wacko church people. It did not reflect well on God. So, discernment that includes best, you've researched it, it's evidence-based. We've got solid foundation for this. Pure, our motives, our hearts are right and blameless. We are going to bring glory and praise to God not, not um, ridicule. I have to tell you, one of the most discouraging, so he told his story, um, our lieutenant told the story in Santa Ana, and then I told this story. I had this lady whose Aunt Susie had died and left her a house. And so she wanted us to bring victims to her house, children. Now, we live in California. Anybody who works here in the schools, in child welfare, anything, we have so many rules that we have to follow, right? And so when I told her we can't do that, she was upset. She began telling people that our task force was persecuting her for her religion. And I'm an ordained minister, and I'm required by law as the administrator to follow the law. And that broke my heart. That broke my heart because it, it misrepresented. It wasn't best, pure. And here's the thing, the next yellow section. I hope by the time you walk out of here, you can quote this verse. For the day of Christ. Let's talk about what is the day of Christ. Where are we going to be? Where are you going to be standing on the day of Christ? You're going to be standing before the judgment seat. So I just gave you guys a study guide. We could even call it a cheat sheet because this is the um, 
rubric that Jesus uses on the day of Christ for judgment. Did what you decided to do pass the best, pure, and blameless description in this verse? We can claim all kinds of glorious action. We can say we did this for 60,000 people. But on the day of Christ, all of the chaff and the wood is burned away. And all that's left, I always wanted to know, what is the gold made of? It is made of best, pure, and blameless. And here is the big finale. It is done to be filled with the fruit of righteousness. It's going to produce good fruit like those six young people in Zambia who were never trafficked. They had no trauma from this. The fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ and this is the big, big finale because everything I do being called to missions when I was 19 years old is to draw people to be salt, to be light, to bring glory and praise to who? God. To God. To bring glory and praise to God. Will you say that whole verse with me? Together. And this is my prayer, that your love may abound more and more in knowledge and depth of insight, so that you may be able to discern what is best and may be pure and blameless for the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. Amen. Amen. Now, I'm going to just give you a, a really quick rundown. We're not going to go through all of these, but there are wonderful examples right in your Bible. You don't have to read the whole book or anything, but one of my favorite is in 2 Kings 4, 1 through 7. There's biblical slavery prevention you all remember the widow? She had a flask of olive oil. And then when she went and asked the man of God what to do because creditors were coming to take her two boys as slaves, that is a scenario that happens right now today around the world. And the man of God told her, Engage your community. Get your family and friends to loan you their empty jars. We're going to skip um, the rest of these slides, but I want you to know she obeyed, and she started pouring from that flask of oil until every jar was full. He never gave her money. God showed up. She was obedient, and now she was an olive oil entrepreneur. And her boys were safe, best, pure, and blameless. In today's world, our children are at risk of being exploited online, sextortion, being trafficked right here in Los Angeles. Youth internet safety is so important. Our Insured Justice Conference coming up March 1st and 2nd, designed for professionals, for students, and for parents. We want our kids to be safe. And we want to teach them what is best, pure, and blameless. Um, these are lots of resources. Pastor can share this PowerPoint with you. I love teaching people how to be best, pure, and blameless when you buy chocolate. Did you know God has best, pure, and blameless for things like what you purchase? Amen. And so we have a tool called the Toil and Sweat app 
that has a thousand pages of research. And when you go shopping, you can find out if the chocolate that you're buying that's really cheap, so not a pure motive. If you're buying it because it's cheap, you just want more for me. But there's a child on the west coast of Africa who is a slave on a cocoa plantation. And we have to stop that. And one way we stop it is being aware, educating our community so they just don't buy that. It costs more to buy the slave-free chocolate because, oh, yeah, somebody's getting paid to harvest it. An adult who can then afford for their children to go to school and get an education. That'll preach for a whole sermon, so I'm going to stop that. And I'm going to close with this prayer. When we wrote the book, I asked my friend, Ambassador John Richmond, to write the foreword. And he tells this story of a survivor of human trafficking that once told him the only thing her trafficker could not control was her ability to pray. You can click on the next slide so everybody can see that. And she prayed that people would do more than be informed. See, we need knowledge, but we also need the understanding, the insight. More than be informed, more than merely have distant compassion. She prayed that people would take smart, strategic action that would restore her freedom and allow her to thrive. Everybody say smart, strategic action. Okay, now your turn. Smart, strategic action. I love your church. They do it. So how do you get that smart, strategic action? Well, we're back to this verse. We need to study the issues. We need knowledge and insight so that we have that wisdom to choose what is smart and strategic, best, pure, and blameless, so we have discernment. You can go online to get more knowledge. You can read the Bible. I have so many great stories of examples of what we can learn about slavery. Oh, my goodness, the story of Joseph. You know Joseph was a slave, right? You know the people of God were slaves. So we have a lot of work to do, but we have a lot that is already part of our biblical understanding. But to be effective in our community, we have to connect in the marketplace, just like Paul. That's what being salt and light is about. And this isn't in my sermon notes, but pastor, this is just, I just feel like this is important right now. I feel like Holy Spirit. To be salt and light, you don't show up with a bandwagon. Salt is the most effective when it's entirely invisible. When Paul was on Mars Hill, in Athens. He didn't preach. He started where the people were talking about an unknown God. That is an example of best, pure, and blameless strategy. Let me pray for you. Lord, I am so grateful for this church, for the leadership, for the opportunity to be connected and partner here as together we find our handle on this pithati to carry this heavy, heavy burden that touches your heart and find our handle. Nobody can do it all. We need each other. We need to do this together. Give us discernment that we will bring praise and glory to your name. In Jesus' name, amen.
Amen. You know, <clears throat> I know for many of us, you know, we come to church on Sunday morning and and uh, we, we want to sing and we want to shout and we want to enjoy God's presence. And that's a part of, part of why we're here. Amen. That, that's a part of why I come. Amen. That's part of our mission. Amen. Is we come to experience God. How many come to experience God? We come to explore his truth. But that last part, Brother Earl, is what? Engage the world. And what we've heard about this morning is a part of why we are here as a church. Uh, we're not here just to have church. We're here to make a difference. And God is calling us to make a difference. Even though what we've heard about is, is not, that's not uh, shouting uh, subjects. But they are a part of our mission as the church that we have to be dis discerning about. Isn't that right? We have to learn about smart strategy, smart, smart action, because we don't know what God is going to be calling us to in 2024. We better get ready. Oh, it's getting quiet in the church. Pastor, we're ready to go to Sizzler. Come on, come on now. 2024, God's calling us to do more than just have church, Grace Assembly. Because if you want to, you can just sit and have church and do that 52 weeks a year, or you can make a difference as the church, which starts with you and I getting full of God's spirit of having wisdom and discernment and doing what is best practices, what is best and, and blameless, right, and pure. We've got to get a hold of that personally. We have to take missions personally. Somebody say, take it personal. Come on, we we so quick to take things personal that had nothing to do with you. And we take it personal. Why are we so slow to take the mission of Jesus personal? I believe God wants us to experience him so that he can fill us up, he can set us free, he can ignite our soul so that we can then engage the world with his purpose. And that's where we really experience God is out there being used. Amen. Amen. I'm, we've, we've heard the word and I'm not going to preach. I got next week. So get, but, 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 these, but these are things that we need to make a matter of prayer and take personally. Say, God, I want to be that person who takes a hold of one of those handles on the vessel. Because what we have heard about this morning is, pro um, Melissa and I, we were just watching again, uh, the, the, uh, the cry for freedom, sound of freedom, thank you, the sound of freedom, which mentions that this whole area of human trafficking is the second largest um, money capital endeavor in the world, soon to, per, soon to overtake arms sales, drug trafficking, human trafficking will be number one. And here's a question that I ask myself pastor, that I ask you, church, where is the church in that? Where is the church? What we have heard this morning is someone who is actively engaged and has been committed to advocating and being a part of a practical solution. And we have a connection to Dr. Morgan and, and, and Brother Gene. Amen. We have a connection. Amen. And we anticipate that that connection will continue and grow as the Lord gives us wisdom. But God is calling us to, to engage the world, and part of it is being a part of human trafficking. Amen? Of, of confronting that. Amen. Would you just bow your head with me just for a moment? I know we've already prayed. But, Lord, I just pray right now for myself and for every part, every member of the Grace family right now. Lord, we look at this challenge. We look at this blight upon not only our country but upon the world and we see the tentacles of Satan throughout it the bondage, the deception Lord just the, the, the robbing of life that takes place as a result of what's going on in human trafficking and Lord we know that there is not just one answer but we want to be a part of one piece of that solution as the church Lord we want to pray, we want to be involved we want to be um, 
educated, informed. We want to know the research, Lord, so that in your timing and in your way, you might use us, Lord God, to do some damage to the kingdom, to pull down the structures and the systems that are allowing this to take place, even if it means just being strong in educating our young people so that there is a preventative element that nobody that's associated with our church family gets sucked into church to, to human trafficking. That we alert and inform our young people. We arm them with understanding. Use us, we pray God. Search our hearts, Lord, that we would be available to be vessels for you, God, in this very important area. We continue to pray, God, your blessing upon Dr. Morgan and the the Global Center for Women and Justice, that you would continue to give them inroads and favor and platform and, and opportunities, Lord, not only to inform and to research and educate, Lord, but to be a part of seeing people not even go into that area, to be, to be rescued by being pre prevented from entering into it, Lord. Continue to bless them, Lord, in the work that they're doing. And let us be a, part, be a church that doesn't stand idly by, but does what you call us to do to be a part of it. And so we thank you for it now in Jesus' name. Amen. Come on, amen. Praise the Lord. Come on, give the Lord a hand of praise this morning. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Dr. Morgan, for that wonderful.